just in case we have an accident. And those are the longest pieces of wood we have to prepare for the canoe. And we've done that first so that if we mess up, we haven't wasted all our wood. The arm's tired now, I can tell you. The fingers from using the crook knife all day, very, very sore. And uh, it'll be good to soak that hand in a, in a cold bath later on. But uh, it's not an unpleasant feeling, though. It's a really honest sort of thing to be doing. And working with this wood in the sun here, it's been fantastic, lovely. Occasional sound of the bullfrogs from behind, the odd heron flying overhead. It's been a lovely day. And uh, it's quite exciting. It's one of those jobs when you start, you really don't want to finish. And you have to force yourself to take breaks so you, that you don't get too tired and make mistakes. Looking forward to tomorrow. When you do things traditionally, that means making the jig you'll use to build the canoe, as well as the canoe itself. So more splitting. But with the right materials, it's incredibly straightforward. I've never worked with cedar before. It splits better than any wood that I have worked with, even better than sweet chestnut. And of course the principles for splitting out bits of wood like this and keeping the split running true are universal. It's a lovely wood to work. And as always, the troublesome areas are like this where there's a knot, and you just have to take your time, and it's a combination of listening to what the wood wants to do, and also telling it what you want it to do. There's a, there's a combination of the two. You have to be very determined and persuade it to go where you want it to. So we're past the knot now. The split's starting to run off to one side, so what I'll do is I'll bend the thicker piece more. And to help me do that, I'll put my knees either side so I've got a fulcrum to work against, like so. And now the split, as you can see, has run back into the middle. If anything, it's gone a fraction too far. I think one of the things that fascinates me about wood is all trees have different personalities. And this wood is a real it's a gentle wood that needs a little bit of gentle persuasion, but uh, at the same time a very reliable wood. Fabulous. Look at that. <laughs> Making everything by hand makes sure you extract the maximum value out of every piece of wood. So these pieces we're making into braces. Yeah, all bracing, all side bracing. Well, when we've finished using them as braces, I guess we can thin these down and use them within the boat itself? Yeah, we'll use them for sheeting and stuff. We'll yeah. recycle the wood yeah. afterwards. So nothing's wasted. Nothing's so even the, even, even the jig and the frame that we are using to build the boat becomes a part of it. Yeah. Recycling materials like this is just one more example of how clever this design is. It's no wonder that it was relied on for so long. The canoe has played a very prominent role in the history of Canada. For 14,000 years, the birch bark canoe was used. The First Nations people needed the birch bark canoe because that's all there was to ply the waterways uh, to accommodate uh, hunting, fishing, trapping, uh, moving their families, and all of these kinds of essential things. The, the birch bark canoe was the only thing they had. The huge impact of the fur trade across the whole of Canada from the 17th century onwards opened up a new demand for birch bark canoes. But even though fur trade canoes were bigger, their design was almost identical. It's remarkable, the diversity. I think in the Canadian Canoe Museum we have uh, over 80 different birch bark canoes. 
right up to the great large fur trade canoes, the canoe de maitre, 36, 38 feet. These canoes were the stuff of legends, carrying heavy loads vast distances for months on end. You could almost say the birch bark canoe built Canada. It was this characteristic ribbed structure that we needed to think about for ours next. No tape measures, remember, so we used a template to mark up where the ribs should go. Whilst that may seem straightforward enough, you need to know what you're doing. It's really interesting. Although we're very early on in the building stage of the canoe, we're having to make important decisions right now. And uh, the spacing of the ribs determines um, if essentially where the thwarts go, the thwarts are the pieces of wood which spread the canoe above the top. And we have to have enough room that I can actually sit in the canoe and get the load in the canoe. It was also the time to determine the width of the canoe. And that there's the... Yep, yeah, that's beautiful. Leave us down, you can take a look at it. Yeah, you? let's try the um, see where it feels. See how it feels. I step in very carefully. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. If anything, it feels a little wide, but then again, it's going to have another what another six inches or so on each end, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, we're going to put the bark will extend a little more. This was a decision only I could make. After all, I was the one who'd be paddling it. After much consideration, we decided to make the canoe slightly narrower. That looks good, doesn't it? Yes. Well, Pinot, I reckon we go with that All width, right. eh? That'll be a good width. A little bit of a compromise, a little narrower. It isn't much, though. It's but um, I think if it's too wide, it's awkward to paddle. I think that'll be good. What do you reckon about here? I think it's better in the other spot. It's a little yeah. bit more. The only other way I thought low. was you know, maybe to go. Same goes down a bit, but right here. This, this goes down a bit here. Yeah. But maybe. At that end. Maybe the there. Should be starting to rise by there. You know. We've been searching for a nice piece of level ground, and it's quite a critical decision because if the ground is twisted, when we build the boat, it'll be twisted too, and that's the last thing we want. What we need is nice level ground, maybe with a, sm a small dip in the middle to give us a bit of rocker, which will enable the canoe to turn better. Birch bark really is an amazing material, and it's got unique properties that enable it to be used for this sort of job. If you look at this cedar bark, for example, if I bend that as though we were going to use it for canoe, you can see that the grain runs along the bark and tends to open up and split. With birch bark, the grain goes exactly the other way, which enables you to bend it like so, and it doesn't split open. Fantastic material. To ensure the canoe takes the right shape, we made a template around which we could fold up the bark. With the template weighted down, we could cut slits to help the bark to fit around the curve of the canoe. So, Pinot, how did you learn to build canoes yourself? I learned from my uncle. Yeah. That's, uh, well, I seen canoes when I was young, being built all the time, because my grandfather was building canoes till a very late age, and I used to see him do it, and I see my father build them. But I actually started working with my uncle. Oh, it must be 10, 12 years ago now. Yeah. Yeah, I just decided to take the summer off. I told my wife I was going to quit work and build myself a canoe and do a birch bark canoe. And after I started, I just never went back to work. You know, it's, just continue to do it. I do it every year. And make a, try and make a so did you ask him to build a canoe? Or no, build actually, it? I ran into him, and uh, he didn't have the confidence in me. He asked me if I built one. I said, no, but I seen your father doing it. And 
My father says, I got a pretty good idea. He says, Oh, you can't. You can't blow 